we Why came. Wait for speed. <laughs> well, we came all the way to Grand Canyon to shoot interviews for National Lampoon's Vacation, and here we are indoors because it's been raining. Oh. And I wondered, kind of, if you faced much of this because you did the f actual filming on the road. Did you, Harold? Did you direct it on the road? Yeah, well, pretty much 65 locations between Denver and Los Angeles. I when I first looked at the at directing when I was doing Caddyshack I thought well let's make a movie outside and we won't need any sets of course you know <laughs> forgetting of course that the sky is half your set and, when and we unpredictable were very unpredictable especially in South Florida but on this on this shoot uh, Victor Kemper who was the director of photography he said trust me I have the greatest luck in the world and it was true, we, we didn't lose one day to shooting, the, uh, to weather the whole time we were on the road. Well, it was a fun picture, also a great travelogue. I mean, it's, that in itself was quite an exciting feature of the film. Now, where did this story come for, from for vacation? And did you draw on a personal experience about this horrible idea of a cross-country family holiday? I think we've all experienced it. Uh, it, it, t it came to me, um, na the National Lampoon ran a very wonderful short story called uh, Vacation 58, written by John Hughes. And the publisher, Matty Simmons, who had also produced Animal House, as soon as he, I think from the moment he read it, he thought this will make a good movie. So he had John Hughes uh, develop a script, and Warner Brothers was very excited about it. And then Matty and I talked about it, and we went to Chevy, and. Uh, there it was. Well, in the satire, I kind of see a little bit of your fine hand. You must have put a little personal uh, touch into that. Well, Chevy and I couldn't uh, resist writing something for it. Uh, you co-wrote National Lampoon's Animal House, which grossed over, what, $200 million, a staggering amount. It's, uh, the critics either hated or loved that film. How do you account for such an extreme reaction? I think we're in a class of films that aren't made for critics because we're not obeying the rules of classic filmmaking. We're not, most of us didn't come to this as filmmakers trying to do art on film. We came to it from show business, from, uh, from the lampoon, from, from the humor business, really. And film is, for us, is the medium for this comedy. It's, it's, a, it's not like my passion. You know, I'm not out there making films for the world art market. Although I, I would like everyone in the world to like the films that I make, I, I think I'm just too much in love with the audience and the audience's response to the movies. All right, Harold. It's often referred to lampoon humor. How do you define it? Can you define it? For me, it uh, has a lot to do with when I and a lot of my contemporaries grew up. Um, I think we grew up in the years after World War II and in the 50s and 60s when I think the country was beginning to sour a little bit on traditional values. Things were starting to fall apart. People were losing confidence in their leaders. Institutions did not seem so respectable anymore. And I also think that Americans love rebels. They love to be shocked. <laughs> Um, they love boisterous things, boisterous comedy. And it, I don't find it radically different from what I saw in the 30s from the Marx Brothers uh, in terms of being shocking, being a little antisocial, the, the heroes of the film being social misfits who eventually win because their hearts are pure. I mean, these, uh, for me, that's a, a very dear formula. I, I, it represents what I believe in a way. That's a good answer. Yeah. Imogene Coca uh, sort of pioneered TV sketches on film and Eddie Bracken hasn't made a film for what, about 30 years mm. and yet they express more in a look than many actors do with volumes of words. Does this, does this technique come from something that they learned in that era? Oh, I think so, definitely. They are both troopers in the uh, traditional sense. And entertainers today, a lot of them don't get the opportunity to perform enough. Uh, Imogene was doing new faces on Broadway in, in the late 30s. Uh, she's really worked. 
this is, comes from vast experience. And Eddie is an old song and dance man, and he was in the Sturgis films of the 40s. He's, they're very experienced. They, they know what they can do. Uh, they're very comfortable doing what they do. They're not out to make it. They're not desperate like a lot of young actors might be. Well, there seemed to be a style in those days, too. Now, that brings into Christy Brinkley, who certainly is gorgeous, by the way. But I'd like to comment on the body language, which basically is Christy Brinkley and very cleverly brought in. It could, is, is that something that's going on, and that's a parody on something that's happening today? And, and what was the mischief that you were doing with that? With Christy's, Christy's body language? She, she played a, a, a woman with no self-consciousness, I think, who was, she's proud of the way she looks. And, and this is Christy. Uh, she, people uh, would be watching us uh, filming, people with their little snapshot cameras, and she would give those people, just for a little snapshot, as much as she would give for uh, the, the finest uh, fashion photographer. She loves the camera. She loves moving around. She's very athletic. And uh, I think it worked well for her character. Oh, it did? Yeah, the hard part for her was uh, when she had to speak her first dialogue ever on film, extended dialogue. And that was a whole new world for her. That's a whole new, that, that would be hard for you. That's hard for a director, isn't it? And by the way, you handle those kids very, very well. Oh, they're also great actors. Yeah, yeah. That, was, that was beautiful. Well, we all loved Beverly D'Angelo in that we, the role itself and the way she played it. A competent, cool, attractive wife for a change, not just a prop. Uh, it was unusual casting in a way. What made you think of her for this role? Um, we worked with um, Marion Doherty, who's the casting director for uh, Warner Brothers, and her two assistants. Uh, and we looked at uh, long lists of actresses and we looked at, uh, we met many actresses, who, uh, some of whom had been successful recently in some pretty popular movies. And everyone, all the ones that really emerged as finalists for us uh, had some lovely quality. Uh, Beverly had an edge that I've always liked in her work. There's something, she reminds me a little bit of June Allison, although I wasn't a big fan of June Allison, there's something about Beverly's voice that, that I like. And uh, she's a very sexy woman, and we liked playing the wife as, uh, as a, a full-bodied person. Yeah, and it, it was nice to see. And she, she had a, a good sense of timing without really pressing hard because she doesn't feel comedy is her strong suit. She really knew how to fit into the ensemble. Comedy is, of course, your strong suit. Um, you're, you're a very successful writer, you've been an actor, and you're a director. Do you think that you would ever do a straight drama? Are you interested in that? Is it... Are you trying to tell me something? Or what? Because <laughs> uh, several people have asked me that. I, I think know. the reason they do is they watch what you can accomplish on the screen with a comedy, and then they meet you and start to, to know you a little bit over a period of interviews, and they, and they see that you personally are an observer, kind of a laid-back observer, and uh, I guess there are all kinds of possibilities there. Yeah, I, I think I would consider it if I had a, a, a strong idea that I was really passionately interested in bringing out. Well, I wouldn't like to see you give up comedy. It's just that we, we would like to see more of you, Harold, and thank you very much. <laughs> thank you, Claire.